we would like to welcome you this morning to our 29th Popcorn Forum presentation. And for your enjoyment, we have some musical prelude for you that will be performed today by Scarlett Hepworth, accompanied by Deborah Gregor O'Dell. So please sit back and enjoy this as we begin our journey through time. And good morning. All of these tunes have something to do with money. So if you listen, th this is the economics day. So you, if you listen carefully, you'll hear <laughs> what's going on in the music that relates to today's topics. The next song is the only one I'm going to introduce, and I'm going to set it up a little bit for you. This is Oh Happy We from Leonard Bernstein's Candide. In this song, two people are talking. Candide, who is the philosopher, and Kunigunda, who is the, uh, the slave girl that he finds they've decided to settle down and get married, but they have totally different ideas about what makes a happy married life. Soon with the earnings from my labor, we'll buy a modest little farm. Our mansion will amaze the neighbors. There we will entertain with lavish charm. Cows and chickens, social whirls, peas and cabbage, ropes of pearls. Soon there'll be little ones beside us. We'll have a sweet Westphalian home. Somehow we'll grow as rich as Midas. We'll live in Paris when we're not in Rome. Smiling babies, marble halls, Sunday picnics, costume balls. Oh, won't my robes of silk and satin be chic? I'll have all that I desire. Pat gloss will tutor us in Latin and Greek while we sit before the fire. Glowing rubies, glowing logs, faithful servants, faithful dogs. We'll round the world enjoying high life. All will be gaiety and gold. We'll lead a rustic and a shy life, feeding the pigs and sweetly growing old. Breast of peacock, apple pie, I love marriage, so do I. things in life are free. 
Thank you. from the floor that's okay with me cause the things that I prize like the stars in the skies are all free oh I got plenty of nothing and nothing's plenty for me I got my gal I got my song got heaven the whole day long no use complaining got my gal got my lord got my song I got plenty of nothing, and nothing's plenty for me. I got the sun, I got the moon, I got the deep blue sea. Deep folks with plenty of plenty, they gotta pray all the day. Seems with plenty, you sure gotta worry how to keep that devil away. Away. I ain't fretting about hell till the time arrives never worry long as i'm well never one to strive to be good to be bad what the hell i is glad i was alive oh, i got plenty and nothing and nothing's plenty for me i got my gal got my song got heaven the whole day long no use complaining got my gal God, my Lord, God, my song. Thank you very much for having me. Have a wonderful day.
Again, I'd like to acknowledge our soloist, Scarlett Hepworth, and also our pianist accompanist, who is Deborah Gregor O'Dell. Let's give them another hand. I want to welcome all of you to our 29th annual Popcorn Forum presentation. My name is Dorinda Moore, and I will be your host today for our time this morning, as well as for our panel time this afternoon at 1 o'clock. So welcome to all of you as we begin our journey through time. And this year's concentration is what happened in the Western world during this past millennium. As you look at our panels behind me, you'll see that each day we will be focusing on a different topic. Yesterday, if you missed, we concentrated on science and technology. Today, our topic is money, 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 uh, the economics and how that has affected us through the millennium. Tomorrow, we'll be focusing on religion, arts, the uh, music. You won't want to miss that as Martin Luther will be our keynote speaker tomorrow. And then on Thursday, <clears throat> we'll focus on democracy, emancipation, and how that has affected us. And then finally, on Friday, we will uh, pull all of it together as we have a roundtable discussion. And at that time, we will pull all of the different disciplines together and find out how they affect us today. If you haven't yet received a program, they are at the doors uh, all over campus, actually. So please be sure to pick one of these up so that you know exactly where you want to be at what time. Uh, there are different time starts. Today is 9 o'clock, tomorrow is 10.30, so you'll want to focus on that. So sit back, relax, and enjoy as we begin our travel. And students, you can completely relax because there's no test at the end of this little performance. Uh, Parents who are out there, uh, you don't have to bring out your checkbook, even though this is economic day, because everything is free. So be sure to remember that. And for you uh, who have come in from the community and oft times come to uh, Schuler Auditorium for our programs, it's easy for you too because there's no reservations required. And as just a bonus, because we are the Popcorn Forum, there's free popcorn this afternoon at 1 o'clock in the new renovated sub, which will be up in the upper level of the Crescent Bay Room. Our panels will begin at 1 o'clock. And there again, free popcorn. It doesn't get any better. No tests, no money, free seat. Be sure you attend all of the program. <clears throat> our format today will be our keynote speaker, whom we are fortunate to have with us today, James Watt. And he will come out and speak to us for about a half an hour. And then at the end of that time, he will answer questions from you, the audience. So be kind of keeping some thoughts in your mind as to what you might like to ask him at the end of that time. And then he will break character for a few minutes and speak to you as Dale Marcy and explain to you some of the things that he could not explain to you as the character James Watt. So that will be our format and we will be through in an hour. So with that, I would like to introduce our day of economics. And economics is, we all think of, I think, money when we think of economics. The Webster definition defines it as this, the science that deals with the production, the distribution, and the consumption of commodities. That means that when you go to get your latte every morning, those coffee beans were produced someplace, then they were in turn distributed uh, through some mechanism, and then they got to your favorite educated cup right here on campus, and you were able to purchase a good quality cup of coffee. That's economics. And our keynote speaker today, James Watt, was very instrumental in the beginning of this entire process. When we think of James Watt, we connect him with the steam engine as the inventor, when in fact he was not the inventor of the steam engine, but he made so many improvements to that that it revolutionized society as we know it today. It was a big turning point. He was known as the uh, the person who instigated the Industrial Revolution 
And so we want to especially recognize what he has done for us, and he will continue and explain to us how this all came about in his economics. So as we begin our journey through time today, I would like for you to welcome James Watt. Thank you, Brenda. Good morning. As Brenda Moore said, I am James Watt. I was invited to speak with you this morning about a time in society that has become known as the Industrial Revolution. Uh, please excuse my nervousness. I was only a humble inventor. I really was not accustomed to speaking to large groups of people. I had to do so on occasion to ask for patents and also to request patent protection. Many times I needed to go to speak to Parliament. And I also had the, the very difficult task of dealing with some of the mine owners who needed to purchase my inventions. And they were very tough to deal with, and I did not like that. I really enjoyed my time in my workshop much more. I like to invent, not necessarily speak. But Tony Stewart asked me if I would come and talk with you today. And so I consented to that, and as the during the introduction, uh, I should clarify with you that I did not invent the steam engine. There were many changes that had occurred in society prior to the invention of the steam engine that, that brought about its creation. The steam engine was a very complicated piece of machinery, and at the time that it was developed in the 16 and 1700s, there was not the mechanism in place in society to produce such equipment. So there needed to be changes in society before such complicated machines could be constructed reliably. The development of this technology was in England. These, these changes were brought on in England by the desire of the people for a more comfortable existence. There were changes that were occurring in politics, in banking and in natural philosophy. Uh, natural philosophy is what people of this time would call science. The age of individualism, capitalism, and materialism was beginning. This was at the end of the reign of the Tudors, the royalty of England that ruled from the early 1500s until the beginning of the 1600s. During the time of the Tudors, the economy of England was changing from one of subsistence agriculture to one of industry. The cornfields were being re replaced by sheep walks that supplied the materials for the woolen industry. Mines were producing iron and coal and tin. Land holdings were changing. Uh, prior to that time, the majority of the land was owned by the royalty or owned by the church. And during the Tudors, the land holdings were changed um, more to individuals in the society. But such transitions don't come easily. And so favorites of the, the court would receive the land. And then with the land, the money that was produced from the land could go back to the sovereign. There were already some inventions that had taken place in society that helped change the society at that time. One of them was the mariner's compass that allowed the movement of humans farther away from the shore so humans had a larger concept of what the, the earth was like. The art of printing had already been developed, so communication was available to those people that were schooled. And gunpowder had been invented, which in some ways was bad, because it allowed warfare on a more dangerous level, but it also allowed expansion of a use of energy that was not available to human beings previously. England at the time had great monopolies that were forming. If the sovereign had a friend, the sovereign might grant that friend the sole right to either import or produce 
a material for society, uh, such a common thing, such as soap. And if you had the sole right to import soap, then of course you had the right to set the prices, and that means you could large, uh, accumulate a large amount of wealth. And then, well, of course, you had to share that wealth with the sovereign. But there were some very blatant violations occurring in the, the realm of monopolies. And so Parliament decided that there needed to be some action to control the monopolies. And so a law was passed in 1624 called the Statute of Monopolies that attempted to control the distribution of sole rights. This was the basis for the patent system, and even though it was flawed, it did promote true invention, because the only people that could earn a patent were those people that, that did have the first idea and got recognition through Parliament. The concept of money was coming about. The panel this afternoon, there are going to be several of the speakers that talk about the development of money. I really wasn't much interested in it myself, at least not as far as how it was developed. I was more interested in how I could get some, because I needed some money to bring my ideas to the marketplace. And some of my ideas were rather grandiose, and so I needed large amounts of money. So it was fortunate for me that the banking system was developing in England in the 1600s, and by 1694, the Bank of England had formed, and a year later, the Bank of Scotland. There was also a phenomenon happening in England known as the formation of, of charter companies. This meant that industrialists could take their money and buy into one another's companies and expand the holding of those companies. Uh, this was very good for me. With a, a banking system with charter companies available, it allowed an avenue for my ideas to come to the marketplace. This was also the, the time of a change in the way that science was done. We called it natural philosophy at the time. In Western culture, from the, the time of the Greeks, men would look at the world around them and observe what happened. And after making a large number of observations, the men would then conclude how nature was behaving. And this was called natural philosophy, the philosophy of nature. By the 1600s, the world of natural philosophy was changing. Instead of just looking at nature, observing nature, men began to think up experiments to investigate nature. For instance, the Honorable Robert Boyle, who was an Englishman, at this time conducted some experiments with confined air. If air is placed into a glass container and some mercury placed on top of the, the gas so that it confines the gas, as more pressure is put on this confined gas, the volume of the gas decreases. If some of the mercury is taken off the top of the confined gas to relieve some pressure, the gas expands. To you folks, this probably doesn't seem like much, but at the time, this was a remarkable observation. And so the Honorable Robert Boyle wrote up this observation and published it to the Royal Society in England that had been formed during the 1600s, and he titled it the Treatise on the Springiness of Air, because air would spring from a region of high pressure to a region of low pressure. This may not seem like much, but to me, as I was doing my work, this was going to be important for my inventions. Many changes were occurring. But these changes were all powered by four energy supplies. One of them was human power. One of them was the power of domesticated animals. And there are problems with those. Everybody that's worked for a living knows the problems of humans and of animals. We don't have much strength 
So we can't have much concentrated power, and we also need to rest a lot. And so for large power supplies, it was necessary to, to locate another source of energy that would provide continual power. So two other power sources that had been developed by the 1600s were wind and water power. Well, again, you can see the problems with wind and water power. The wind doesn't always blow, so even if you have a very nice windmill, it doesn't turn and give you power if the wind isn't blowing. And a lot of terrestrial landforms don't have water on them, so that means that all of your other power supplies are either located in very windy areas or right close to a, a moving water supply. So there was a demand for these industries that were developing in England to find another source of power. And that was taken up by many men at the time. As with any change in science or society, many great minds work on it at once. And that's no difference with the invention of the, the steam engine. Many men before me and at my time worked on the development of an engine that would use the weight of the atmosphere and fire to, to produce work. So what about the weight of the atmosphere? In 1643, an Italian named Evangelista Torricelli had published a treatise on his mercury and water experiments that showed that the atmosphere would balance a weight equivalent to 28 feet of water. Well, that's a lot of, of weight, and so inventive men said, well, how can we use this tremendous weight of the atmosphere to do work for us? Probably the first people that get credit for this were some Englishmen, great big long list, many people worked on it. Um, the goal of these first men were to move water. Because if water is where you want it, of course, you always want it somewhere else, especially if you want to drink. So one of the, the challenges was to move water as drinking water, and another one was to remove water from mines. With the advent of industry and with the technology that was being developed at the time in the metals industries, minerals need to be, needed to be procured from the earth. And as humans dug deeper in the earth, sure enough, you hit water. And it was very inefficient to try to get a draft animal on a turnstile to use a Archimedes screw and lift water out of the ground. Flooded mines don't produce much coal or much tin. And so the first development of the steam engine on large scale was for the movement of water. And I have, am trying out some technology that I'm, I'm not that familiar with. I, hear that nowadays we can project pictures on the wall, and so I'm going to try that and show some slides to maybe help you understand something about what a steam engine looked like in my day. And so hopefully this is somewhat visible around the room. This is a steam engine that was erected. It says up here that nobody can read, but I can tell you what it says. It says that this was erected in 1712. Well, this was before my time. I can hardly take credit for the steam engine when I wasn't born until 1736, and this was already operating in 1712. The reason I include this slide is to give you some idea of the magnitude of these machines. Notice we have this human down here, and I have somebody else uh, with a laser pointer helping me. Thank you very much. Uh, we also, you can see the size of the firebox. This is where the coal would be thrown in the firebox. Steam would be produced, and the steam in this cylinder would cause energy to be transferred to this beam, and the beam would raise and lower and pull water out of the ground. This is the smokestack. Obviously, this engine, when it was painted, it was not in operation because these were smoke bellowing monsters. This was called a fire engine. Nowadays you might call them a steam engine, but in this day it was a fire engine because we used fire in this engine to do work. And the fire came from the burning 
of low-grade coal. Well, this was the world into which I was born in 1736 was a world of an expanding economy in England with large steam engines, and I was born in Scotland. My, my start in life was not a good start. I was not a very healthy child. So even though I went to school and even though I was quite skilled in mathematics, my father still had a very difficult time finding a position for me in a guild. The guild system was still in place where you would go to work as an apprentice and get trained in a craft, but you needed to have some connections to do that. And I was, I was not able to find a position, but my father was influential enough that he found a position for me in an instrument, a mathematical instrument repair shop. Uh, at that time, the main instruments that were repaired in these shops would be mariner's equipment, especially compasses, and also surveying equipment. And so I got this position, and I worked for two years. And by the time I got done, my master thought that I was pretty good, but I could never make a living at it because I was too slow. One of the problems that I had when I worked on equipment, I was never satisfied with just fixing it. I always wanted to know, how did it work? I'd always work on it and make it work better, and that made me very slow. So my master was quite disappointed in me, and as a result, he didn't assist me very much in getting a position after my two years of apprenticeship were done with him. But my father was the treasurer of our town, and so he secured a position for me at a college in Glasgow. And it was in Glasgow that I first encountered the Newcomen steam engine. This is my steam engine that I worked on. There are some people in your time that think my contributions were quite significant, so I have actually visited my museum in, in London where this is kept. I have a lot of memories about this steam engine. As you can see, it's somewhat smaller than the steam engines that were being used out pumping water from coal mines, but it still worked the same. You can see that this is my engine, the firebox, this is where the water would be boiled, and this is the cylinder, and here's the beam to run the pump rod. And so I was told I was supposed to repair this. There had already been a, one repairman put on this task and couldn't solve the problem. So I thought, well, it would be a challenge. So I went to work on the steam engine. As my nature would dictate, I wasn't satisfied with just learning how to fix it. I wanted to know how this engine operated. Most of the men that worked the steam engines in the, the coal mines or in the tin mines just built them and made them work, but they really didn't understand why they worked. But with my little model, I figured out how such a steam engine works. And with some luck, uh, with this slide I can give you a little better idea of the operation. This is still a Newcomen steam engine. No invention of mine. Here's the firebox. Here's where the water is boiled. As water goes to steam, a valve is opened and the steam is allowed to go into the cylinder. The cylinder, as it fills up with steam, pushes the piston up, which tips the beam and drops the pump rod down in the mine to the pump head. After the cylinder is flush with steam and the steam exits out the snifting valve, had to put through several volumes of steam to make sure all the air was pushed out or it would wind log. When enough steam is pushed out so there's no more bubbles coming out of the snifting valve, which was just a water surface, cold water would be injected into the cylinder, cause the steam to condense, as here, here's Torricelli's work, as the mass of the atmosphere, the weight of the atmosphere pushes down on the cylinder because we have pressure outside, less pressure inside, the cylinder the piston moves down the cylinder and the pump rod 
is moved up and pumps water out of the mine. These were automatic. You see we have another uh, little arch here that runs the water system to pump the water. So all the engineer, the man who operated the machine in the field, all the engineer had to do was get it to start and then keep it running, but it really took care of itself, opening and closing and producing energy from fire the fire energy being transferred into mechanical energy through this steam engine. Well, with my little engine, I figured out that this was very inefficient. I noticed with some calculations that it took a large amount of excess heat to get this cylinder to heat up and cool every time since I was using the same cylinder, the Newcomen design, for both the expansion with steam and the cooling with the cold water to cause the contraction of the cylinder through the condensation of steam to water. So it came to me and I told a, a friend of mine, Robert Hart, I said, why steam is just like any other gas it will move from a region of high pressure and expand into a region of low pressure. And then that way I can make the engine much more efficient. Well, it was a great idea. Probably one of the better ones I ever had, but unfortunately, moving from a scale the size of this engine to the scale the size of one in the mines required someone to support me. And so, I had to find a financier. Actually, I went through several. The first man that I was introduced to was, was an ironman. He w made his fortune in another technology that had to develop at the same time as the steam engine, which would be the manufacturing of iron commodities. And he was a very wealthy man who had extended his money into many companies and through his help I was able to construct my first steam engine. This was my design of a steam engine. This is a small model that I constructed and my engine was different in as much as I built a more efficient firebox. I still took the steam out of a boiler, put it into a cylinder, but now instead of condensing the steam in this cylinder I had a separate condenser. The use of my separate condenser made my steam engine about twice as efficient as the Newcomen engine. So I had a way to make energy much more available throughout the mining world because I had a steam engine that would be more efficient. The Newcomen engines were very inefficient. The only way a mine could afford to run one is if they had low-grade coal to feed the engine. But if we were going to move into a tin mine or into an iron mine to pump water, maybe the coal was going to be some distance away and transportation costs were so high that we needed to have a more efficient engine. So my steam engine was a great idea. Unfortunately, even though I patented the steam engine and obtained a patent for it in 1769, I still couldn't get it to the marketplace because my financier had gone into bankruptcy. And actually, I thought at the time it was a disaster, but it turned out to be the, one of the best circumstances that could have befallen me because he sold the patent rights to another industrialist known as Matthew Bolton. And Matthew Bolton should get the credit for being the man that saw the true potential for the steam engine. He could see that there were many industries in England and in Europe, even though England and France were, uh, seemed to be continually fighting wars, the industrialists that lived in Europe and in England still traded ideas and information and technology with one another 
And Bolton could understand that the potential for expansion of the steam engine into other areas other than just pumping water would enlarge the application of the steam engine tremendously. So he pushed me very hard to convert from my small experimental model, this one, into a large engine that we could put in to a mine operation. And so in 1776, he pushed me into putting together an engine to go into a, a coal mine. And also, and this was the innovative part, he pushed me to put an engine into an iron foundry. So there was no need to pump wire, water in a foundry. It was put on the end of the, the bellows. So it was the blower. It was a blowing engine that would blow air into the, the firebox of a foundry to increase the temperature of the fire. And it worked. Now this is really quite amazing. You, you might go, oh, you didn't. You'd be expected not to. But at the time of this technology, each engine was a unique engine. The cylinder would be made in a foundry. It would be hauled to the site where it was going to be erected. All the valving, all these valves would be manufactured in a plant, but they were manufactured by individuals who were craftsmen. So each one was unique. And so the costs were very high. And the, all these engines were very challenging. One of the jobs that I had as I worked for Bolton in the 1780s was assembling these engines. And this was a very trying time. Travel in those days was a little different than what you have as you arrived on campus today. It was a very grueling thing to travel 10 miles. We'd get in the carriage. We'd ride over the rough roads the bad weather, we get to the, the city where we were supposed to stay the first night, you go to the inn, and it would be full. Well, so what do you do? You get back in the carriage, ride another couple of miles into the dark to get to another city to try to find an inn so you could stay there. After four or five days of travel this way from our manufacturing plant in Birmingham, to a remote site, say in Scotland or in southern England, we would arrive on site and then assemble one of these steam engines. And imagine that little engine that was in the first slide. I say little engine. By the time my engines were being constructed, these cylinders were 10 feet tall. They were six feet across. They would weigh six and a half tons. The coal consumption was ferocious even though they were more efficient. The beams were made out of hardwood that could be procured locally, or I developed the technology that would make them laminated. Word hadn't been invented yet, but it was a stronger beam. But all this had to be assembled on the site, and we had to then, of course, make it airtight, because if we're going to put steam in this cylinder and get a piston to go up and down, it has to be an airtight system. And I dreaded this part. Show up, there'd be a bunch of belligerent miners. They wanted the engine to work immediately, and I would struggle. And I would spend many days erecting each engine, and I would tell Matthew Bolton, I'd say, if I'm going to be a value to this company, let me go back and work in the, my shop. Get someone to help me. So finally he decided that I really was more useful full-time in the shop doing development than I was out in the field setting up engines. So he hired another Scotsman to help me, a, a man named William Murdoch, and he was an interesting Scotsman. He was a man of temperance, which was rather odd, and it made it so that he could actually show up on site and stay sober and assemble an engine. And he was a, an excellent engineer. He understood, I could teach him how an engine worked, and he understood, and he had his own ideas. So he contributed ideas so that we could continue advancing the quality of these steam engines. Hmm. 
I have the same problem with steam engines. So this is a schematic. This was a, a presentation that I made to Parliament. This was one of my tougher days in my life. In 1782, uh, we had already negotiated uh, one patent, or excuse me, it was 1775, the time blend together through the years. In 1775, uh, we decided that we really needed an extension of the patent if we were going to ever recover any money from our inventions. And so I had to go to Parliament and make a presentation to Parliament. It took an act of par Parliament to get a patent extension. And so I was sent, and I had written up my documents ahead of time. I had about 40 pages of notes to stand and read to Parliament. And they were a very hostile audience. It wasn't going well. I could tell the patent extension wasn't going to work. And then Matthew Bolton showed up. He was a commanding man, much different than I. And with his presence, and also a little behind the scene dealing, we managed to get a patent extension for 25 years. With the patent extension, I could then go back to the workshop and I created other technologies to put on the steam engine. Notice now we have a different mechanism for transferring the energy instead of a beam. It allowed this rod to move more vertically. If with this patent uh, request right here, it was still not visible on this slide is the, the firebox and the, the boiler for production of steam, but the valving that would bring the steam in applied steam to both ends of the piston in the cylinder. This allowed it to be much more efficient. Oh, efficiency, I should tell you how I made my money. I was really proud of this one. Uh, if you're going to build a better steam engine, you have to get the people that you're selling it to to realize it's a better steam engine. So a friend of mine named John Smeaton, who had done the calculations on the efficiency of the Newcomen engines, I sat down with him one day and we compared our calculations. And I showed him that with my calculations, my steam engine would run at higher pressures. I could get my engine to run at pressures of around three quarters of an atmosphere. And his engines, the Newcomen engines, ran about half an atmosphere. And I developed a system of measurement to standardize how much work these engines could do. So for a bushel, bushel of coal, I calculated that we could raise 7 million pounds of water one foot high. And then we could use this comparison to rank the Newcomen engines with my steam engine. Well, once we had the, the mine owners agree that that was a valid way to test the engines, I could show them that my engine was twice as efficient, so I cut them a deal. I said, I've got such a deal for you. Instead of you just paying for my engine as I set it up, all you have to pay me is one-third the cost of the savings in coal calculated over 25 years. What a deal. They couldn't refuse. So many regions in the country that needed a steam engine that did not have access to low quality coal would set up my steam engine because it was more efficient and then they could pump water out of their tin mine or out of their iron mine. Well, I, I keep saying bad things about the miners, but you know, one mine owner would sell the mine to another man. My steam engine would be set up in the mine and the new owner would come to me and say, well, why should I pay you? You know, I, I still got 10 years left on this contract. You're a rich man. You don't deserve any money. And so I was in continual difficulties with the mining companies to try to, to obtain what I considered to be rightfully mine, payment for my engines. Like I say, I, I was not a very good public speaker 
and when you show up and have to deal solo with four or five miners who are very wealthy and have gotten wealthy using my engine, sometimes I would become very frustrated. That's one reason Matthew Bolton consented to hire Murdoch to help me, to keep me away from the miners. Also, Matthew Bolton realized that Birmingham, Manchester, and London were steam mill mad. There was opportunities for steam mill development throughout England and Europe. So he wrote me a letter and said, I don't mean to hurry you, but I think in the course of a month or two, we should determine to take out a patent for certain methods of producing rotative motion from the fire engine. Well, okay, so he pressured me a little bit, a month or two. But I also had had some ideas of how to take the vertical motion from the steam engine, this is the same bar off a steam engine, and now I apply it to a crank and to some gears and to a flywheel, and I can transform the vertical motion the reciprocating motion into a rotative motion. And this is where we really made our money. Now we had a method of taking power to the granaries to grind the grain, to the woolen industry to run the spindles, because mechanization in the woolen industry had already occurred. There was already some interchangeability of parts had been developed so that you build one woolen machine and you could fit many different parts into it between machines. All they needed was a power supply and here was the way to get the power supply. So when I was supposed to talk about economics, I guess I should talk a little bit about the economics. I was not an economist, but I understood that you needed to have some avenue to get money to make money, and then you needed to have some way to make money over time. And so with my inventions of the steam engine, when we, we build our foundry and our manufacturing plant in Birmingham, we, Bolton had the vision that if you could interchange parts in a woolen machine, or in a, a cotton gin, as was being done over there in the colonies, then why not interchange parts in a steam engine? So in our manufacturing facility in Birmingham, we developed the technology to make valves that were standardized. And then we could take our valves for the steam engines out and place them on any engine didn't have to be ours, it might be a Newcomen engine, because there were still both kinds of engines being used. Oh yeah, by the way, we also took a royalty off every one of the valves. One of the partners we brought in to this business with us was a fellow named Wilkinson, who just happened to have the patent and the technology for boring the cylinders very uniformly. See, it took many changes in society to bring our steam engine into power production for society. We had to have changes in banking. We had to have changes in how to capture the energy. But we also had to have changes in how to handle the metals. And so the hammer mills that could hammer out sheet metal and then shape it, you still had to have some technology to grind it, to bore it. And of course, cannons had been bored for some time, but they were smaller. If you're going to bore a cylinder that's six feet across, that technology uh, had not been developed until Wilkinson in the late 1780s. So of course, we brought him in as a partner, and he built our cylinders for us. With each one of them, we then had some royalties. So I had a very comfortable life as a developer. I was a, a very good inventor. I invented many things other than the, the steam engine, or I should say these modifications to the steam engine. I invented a, a type of printing press. I 
in my later years, uh, started another company to sell printing presses and brought my son in on that company. And so we expanded significantly our holdings on the, in the economics of England. I standardized the power that was measured on our steam engines. That was how the horsepower came about, how much energy equivalent to what a horse could produce. And steam engines powered the changes for the Industrial Revolution. I don't think the Industrial Revolution occurred because of the steam engine. It would have occurred anyway because people in the society were demanding products. They were demanding a better life. It was just the steam engine that stepped in to provide this power. There are some people that say that my patent that I had extended for 25 years slowed down the Industrial Revolution, but I don't believe so because the Newcomen engine had been in operation for 60 years pretty much unchanged until I came along. So what's another 25-year extension? It did allow me, a humble inventor, to realize some reward from my invention, which I probably would have never obtained had it not been for patent protection. So changes in the society in banking and in the concepts of patents, and along with some innovative and educated men like myself, allowed changes that became known as the Industrial Revolution. So I think at, at this time, uh, by looking at my, how far I've gone in my script, I guess it's probably time to ask you if you have any questions of me and see what I might be able to tell you that satisfy your needs. Yes, sir. Did you develop the formula for 33,000 horse, uh, foot pounds of horsepower? Okay. The, yeah. The, the question is, did I devise, develop the formula for 33,000 uh, foot pounds per horsepower? That, that definition, and, and actually, yes, I did. Um, we had measured, and in fact, it was known in society how much work a horse could do on a turnstile how much poundage could be put into a, each minute by a horse. And so if you figured that out over how long you could work a horse each day, then you could see what a, a, a horse could do. And so I was the one that, that did that calculation. Actually, I think it came out something like 32,800. But I, you know, with a slide rule, it's very hard to carry along those numbers. And so I rounded it to 33,000 for my tables. But yes, I, I guess I, a unit of measurement nowadays is known as the watt is named after me, which I find curious because uh, actually what I developed was the horsepower. Yeah. Yes. Did I ever get married? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I did. Uh, I was, was married to uh, a young woman right at the beginning of, of my career. And in fact, she was uh, one of the reasons that I had to move from where I was an instrument repairman. For a while, I became a civil engineer. Uh, at that time, a civil engineer was a person who surveyed. And there was a large demand for moving water from one place to another for canals for transportation or to get water power before the steam engine was, was in place. And so, uh, I starved out because I had a wife and, and a family. I starved out as the instrument repairman at the college. Even though it was a great life, I liked hanging out with the professors and talking about my inventions and natural philosophy. But because of the pressures of my family, I ended up uh, taking uh, a job as a surveyor. Uh, I was away from home when my wife passed away. In fact, I received the letter two days after she died. Uh, that was the way communication was in those days. I was in Scotland, and, and she was uh, several days away. And so um, it was quite a few years before I remarried, but actually I was married twice. Yes? 
What city did I die in? Do I have to talk about that? Oh, that's an unpleasant thing. Um, uh, actually, I had gone back to, to Scotland, and so I was living in the countryside. I, I was wealthy enough that I didn't have to live in a, in a city. Is there other questions? Yes. Oh, the, the engines would easily last 25 years. So when we set up 25-year contracts, um, it was, they would easily run. There were some of the, the Newcomen engines, when I started bringing my engines into the mine, some of the original Newcomen engines were still in operation for 50 years. These were, were very big, rugged uh, machines. There was always an engineer that had to tend them. And uh, an engineer in those times was different than what you might think of an engineer in a suit and a tie and, and uh, driving a Mercedes. But uh, in those days, the engineer was in a horse-drawn carriage with grease in his hair and blackened fingers from hammering and dealing with the leaks and the, the soldering that was necessary on these steam engines. But yeah, they lasted many years with continual care. How long did it take to make a steam engine? Well, when we would receive an order, since they, many of them were, were made individually, we would then contract with Wilkinson to hammer out uh, an engine cylinder and then bore us. That would, that would take several days. We were making the valves so we had them setting aside so they could be assembled. We would take all the parts. It might take two weeks to ship them to the site, and many times it would take a month to erect the engine. This is after already the brickwork was done, so we already had the, the firebox built, we already had a lot of the brickwork, the approach, the landscape, everything prepared. It might take several weeks up to a month just to assemble the pieces, and then depending on uh, how much the engine fought us, it might take a month to get the engine to run. But once they ran, then they lasted for years. But the development, you know, taking the pieces and setting them up, it always was a many month process. Yes? Patent rights. The question is did my interaction with the miners, did it help define? the patent right interactions and protect inventors. Um, I would be egotistical to say yes, but there had been many challenges before me. In fact, I challenged some patents in what I did. I was infringing on patents. And then a uh, disgruntled employee that we had at, at Watton Bolt, uh, Bolt Company um, moved away from us and took some ideas from us and did their own patent. And um, so we were in continual patent battles. But it was before us, but I think some of our patent fights helped define in England how to um, maintain patent rights. Uh, at that time, it did take an act of parliament to resolve a patent issue. So uh, we avoided uh, patent conflicts as much as we could. Uh, for fear of losing. And uh, one more question. Yes. Uh, who is credited with inventing the steam engine? Who is credited with inventing the steam engine? Uh, probably the man that had the first patent should be credited, and that was Thomas Savory. On the very first slide that I showed you, there was Thomas Savory and also uh, Newcomen. Both names were shown there. Uh, again, it was this patent business. Savory had a patent for any machine that would use the epilation of fire. And his steam engine didn't work, but he had the patent. Well, when Newcomen built an engine that worked, he could then try to patent it and get into a patent fight with Savory, or they decided to team up. And so uh, the first person that should be credited as Savory, it was his idea, but Newcomen took the ideas and was able to assemble them and get them into a working machine. 
Okay, I probably, with, in the interest of time, I probably should come out of, out of character and be Dale Marcy for a little bit. And, and now I'm Dale Marcy, and uh, the, the work that I did in investigating the, the steam engine and how it was developed was really quite informative to me. I knew about steam engines, but I didn't know several of the questions that were asked me. I, too, was guilty of thinking James Watt was the inventor. That's what it says in the encyclopedias. But it, it really took many people to develop this technology and many changes in society. And so it was very interesting to me as I learned about James Watt and the steam engine to learn how many changes had occurred in society at the same time. It was not just one person's idea or one person's idea to change society. It was really a massive movement that was a demand by people for a better life, for materialism. And that was a lot of fun to learn that. So do you have any questions for me as Dale Marcy before I leave the stage? Yes. What's my personal opinion? I think it was very fortunate that he got the 25-year the extension because at the time, uh, one of the, the technologies that was in crowding the atmospheric engine was a high-pressure engine. And considering all the problems that had occurred with this atmospheric engine, to try to handle an engine that it was three or four times the pressure of the atmosphere would have been very dangerous. And the reason Watt, uh, he put off those developments was because he fought his whole career with trying to keep the atmospheric engine from leaking. So if you're going to have an engine that operates at higher pressure, you have to have better technology. So really, it wasn't so much um, the fact that he slowed it down, it was that other technology slowed down the changes. Uh, while his patent was still in place, and this would be uh, right at 1800, I think about, by about 1802, the first high-pressure engine had been developed. So there was technology developing, but they really couldn't control the pressures anyway. So, uh, you know, obviously, if... You know, if the first one was built in 1802, people had been working on it prior to the exhaustion of his patent. So I really don't believe he slowed it down significantly. Then maybe made a better world. He also tried to work on making a cleaner firebox. He, uh, they figured out right away that air pollution was going to be a, a real problem. He killed Bolton's garden. His first experimental engine they built at Soho outside their manufacturing plant, as they fired it up, it produced so much smoke and particulate that it killed the garden next door. And so he fi figured out right away that you have to do something about the technology. So it was, it was a change in, in many technologies before uh, the steam engine could really evolve into what many people in the audience think about a steam engine that, that powers a, a boat or powers a, a train. I'm sure many of you have more questions that you would like to ask. Uh, Dale will be available for those of you who can stay, but in the interest of time, we do need to kind of wrap up our formal get-together. I want to remind you, though, that uh, the panel this afternoon at 1 o'clock, you can meet some of the richest people in the world that have been throughout the century. We have queens, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Isabella, Queen Adriana, and we have uh, such powers as Karl Marx. We have Henry Ford, who will be there this afternoon. So those of you who are interested in how your automobile goes about, you can come and hear him. So please plan on being with us this afternoon at 1 o'clock, and that, again, will be over in the sub. And then <clears throat> plan on coming back tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Martin Luther will be here as we go into the field of religion, arts, and the uh, philosophy. At 10.45, we will have special music that will be uh, bringing us into that era. And then on Thursday, you won't want to miss that because we go into the world of democracy. Thomas Jefferson will be with us, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. So for those of you who haven't ever had the chance to meet them, do show up on Thursday, and you'll have a first-hand experience of that. And then again on Friday. 
So watch your program, and thank you, Mr. Watt.